Warm greetings to everybody. Today we will have a new study which bears the title The Mark of the Beast and Nephilim. This topic talks about the last events on earth and it is connected to those events that were happening far back in the past before the flood time and after, when people of Israel were entering the promised land. First verse, which we are going to read, is in Matthew 19, 14 to 15, and it says, but Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. We can see Jesus loved children so much. When disciples would forbid children to disturb and visit him, he told them not to do so. And happily he put his hands upon children and blessed them. We see the God of New Testament is the one who loves children so much and it is interesting. He said that the kingdom of heaven is actually made for children because they are honest, innocent and because of that the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. But when we read one text from the Old Testament, for instance Joshua 6.21, we can find this. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and women, young and old, and ox and sheep and as with the edge of the sword. Other word for young is children. We see God in Old Testament ordered that women, children and old men must be killed. Uh, that is utterly destroyed. Now we can make a question. Is the God of New Testament and Old Testament the same God? What is going on here? How God says that he loves children and the kingdom of heaven is theirs, but on the other side the same God says that children shall be murdered with the edge of the sword. This is a study that needs to give us an answer for such a complex question and to discover God's love in the most beautiful way, to show us the power of the sin and the great enmity and rebellion of the fallen angels and to reveal to us the great problem which fallen angels are causing to us in order to have us destroyed. The next text from Matthew 12, 22 says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. In the Holy Word of God is written that Jesus had many times healed many people who were possessed by demons. It is the case we just read now. The man was possessed by the demon, the Lord Jesus came and cast the devil away from him and healed him both spiritually and physically. What is the conclusion we can get out of this text? It is that man, even being possessed by the demon, he is not a hopeless case for the Lord. The Lord can help him. He can cast the enemy away and he can heal him spiritually and physically. Then we can make another question. Is there a limit that a man can go over? And if so how far he can go before even the Lord cannot be able to help him. In the time of flood, man passed the limits when there was no possible anymore to return back to God. They consciously chose the position and God always calls us back. God always advises us, doing all for us just to return to him and to have everlasting life. But when people consciously reject, in which even God himself couldn't help them anymore, then the terrible judgment had to come upon the earth. Indeed, this study is giving us more insight about it. To better understand this study, first we must answer the next question. Who are the sons of God? The next verse from Luke 3, 37-8 tells us, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Malaleel, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. We see that all men are all said to be sons of some men because their fathers were men. But in the case of Adam, his father was God because he was the direct creation that came out of the hand of God. And that is why he says Adam, which was the son of God. When the Bible talks about the sons of God, it talks about persons who directly came out of the hand of God and those who God is directly their father. The Bible also tells that if we accept our Savior Jesus, we become the sons of God by adoption. 
we will now bring four texts from the Old Testament which talks about who are the sons of God and we will notice that all four texts talk about angels. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. It was a meeting in heaven and angels or the sons of God gathered before the Lord and then Satan came as well as the representative of this earth. Adam was meant to go to that meeting as the son of God, but because Satan deceived him and took the authority from him, Satan was the one now who was going to meetings as the representative of this earth. And all that lasted until the cross when Lord Jesus took away the reinship from Satan. And now Jesus is the representative as the second Adam in the heavenly courts. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Here he says that morning stars are angels, so sons of God shouted for joy when God created the man. It was so because angels were astonished when God was creating beings which will even physically look alike God. They will have two arms, legs, and physically will look alike God and angels. So they shouted for joy how God in his infinite wisdom created a man, Adam and Eve. Angels were present and they observed the creation of man. I have said, ye are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Even though fallen angels are also the sons of the Most High, same as the good ones, the good angels who remain on God's side, one day in the future they will all die like men. They will end up in the lake of fire. God will execute the judgment upon them for all the evil they caused to themselves and to the people. From all texts we read, we see when he says sons of God, it is thought of angels or Adam, who is the recreation of God. Next text from 1 Corinthians 15 tells us there are different types of bodies, natural, that is physical, and spiritual. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. Some translations say he was made in a natural body. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The first man is of the earth, earthly, and the second Adam is the Lord from heaven. As the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. It is very important to mention there exists a natural body and exists a spiritual body. Um, in the Bible, spiritual body in Greek language is called ikitirion. That is an angelic body and it is a body which our Lord Jesus Christ took when he was resurrected. And as it is written here, we bear the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. During the resurrection and transformation, people will receive that heavenly body or ikitirion, in which our Lord Jesus Christ was resurrected and ascended to heaven. That body is the body of angels, which is invisible for us people. It can materialize and become flesh and blood. And it can also dematerialize it and return into spiritual dimension, which makes it invisible for our eyes. This is of such a tremendous importance to us to know when we are talking about this study. Angels were quite often taking human body and shape when they were communicating with people. For instance, in Mark it is written, And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. When certain persons came to the sepulchre, which was empty because Lord Jesus was already resurrected, they saw a young man, but he was an angel who communicated with them later on. During Christ's ascendance, while people were stunned, observing the way he was moving up 
then something happened. Let's read Acts 1, 10 to 11. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men, and they were angels, stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up for you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. We see angels materializing quite often and they look to us like men. Next text is telling us about Sodom and Gomorrah when two angels visited. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, into your servant's house, and tarry all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned into him and entered his house. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house around, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Other translation says, bring them out to us, that we can have sexual intercourse with them. We see the people say for angels, where are the men which came into thee this night? We see great sin of Sodom citizens here, because the word used to know is the word used for Adam when he had an intimate relationship with his wife Eve, and after she bare him a child. But in this case, people ask Lord to bring out those two angels which they seen them as men to know them. It is interesting that they were young and old people and all seek for them to come out, to have an intimate action with them. What it means, old and young seeking for these nice men to know them? What does it remind you of today? What people of today say, making parades and so on, Today we have two men come together and they make a marriage. Then two women make a marriage and then they go into intimate relationship. For instance, a man can go into intimate relationship with an animal then to enter the marriage legally before the register. Very soon all these types of perverted or deviant behavior like zoophilia will happen and everything will be possible. But we know that God said how it caused him a sorrow in his heart when a man goes so low. This all tells us how great the sin of Sodom was. In Genesis 3.15, important verse says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here is prophesied that Messiah will come through the seed of woman, who will step on the snake's head, the old serpent, or Satan, as Bible calls him, which was the seed Messiah was to come from. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promise made. He said not, and to seeds as of many, which is in plural, but as of one, which is singular, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the woman's seed, which is Abraham's seed as well, is in fact Christ who will step onto Satan's head. Then he says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and his according to the promise. Satan decided to destroy the plan of salvation by any means and to contaminate human body. To that extent, it would be impossible for the coming of Messiah or the women's seed. When Satan heard the promise, he understood that Jesus would take the body of a man as Eve's descendant. He made a plan to prevent the coming of Christ. He forged a plan to mingle the human nature with the fallen angel's nature, which is corrupted by the evil seed that, that much that it makes it impossible to be restored, but condemned to destruction. Grace time for fallen angels is gone. God was mercifully calling them back, was influencing their consciousness, but they were rebelling so much until they decided to turn their back completely to God, to become His sworn enemies. 
they matured in sin, so there was no more way for them to be saved. In other words, fallen angels are irreversibly evil. So the Holy Spirit from God, who is the only good, when withdrawn from man, only selfishness, evilness and corruption remain. For fallen angels it is written in Matthew, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. We see that this biblical text talks about everlasting fire, or the fire of destruction which is not prepared for people, but for the devil and his angels. However, people who are persistent to follow fallen angels and being deceived, unfortunately they will go to the lake of fire altogether with them. Bible is telling us that Jesus came and took our body, and as the second Adam in our body achieved the plan of salvation and revealed perfect and spotless character. The text says, Forasmuch then as the children are partaker of the flesh, the body, and blood, he also himself likewise took a part of the same, that is the same genetics. It means he took our body, our genetics, our flesh, our blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. This is the promise of Abraham, or Abraham's descendants, which Jesus inherited from Eve, Abraham and many more. Wherefore in all things he behold him to be made like unto his brethren. And truly Jesus was the man like us, having the human body, same as we are. And the next text says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh, speaking of Christ, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the next text says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. We see that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh after 4,000 years, weakened by the power of sin. Jesus redeemed fallen Adam's nature by dying for us all and made it possible for a man to become new creation in Christ through spiritual rebirth. Then for us who believe in Christ, he says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed, respectively Christ's spirit, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Then Bible advises us, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in Corinthians, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not own body? For ye are bought with price, by all means glorify God in your body. We see that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we need to glorify God in our bodies and preserve it, so the Spirit of God would be able to live in us. However, Satan decided to transform fallen Adam's body, which we inherited. He decided to unite human nature with fallen angelic nature, so he could create new change and contaminated humanity with its own evil nature similar to fallen angels for whom there is no salvation. And that was Satan's infernal plan. And then in Jude we have an interesting text saying, And the angels which kept not their first estate, we have many different angels like cherubim, seraphims with different positions in accordance to hierarchy, who left their estates, rebel against the God, and then committed something, which we read further. He says they left their own habitation, which is Greek word again, ikitirion, their spiritual body, which he had reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. 
we see there is a limit for the angels too, so when they go over it, God reacts and executes appropriate judgment upon them. It was the same upon the cities like Sodom and Gomorrah when they crossed the limit. God executed the appropriate judgment upon them. But it wasn't a final judgment, it is still waiting for angels. And so for Sodom and Gomorrah, when citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah will all resurrect in the second resurrection, and then they will come out for a judgment together with these fallen angels. So what is it all about? The Greek word ikitirion, translated in English as a house or habitation, it is referred to a body which is in the dwelling place for spiritual beings. The word ikitirion is being used only in two places in the scripture, two very interesting places. It is appearing in Jude 6, which we just read, um, which describes angels have uh, left or abandoned their spiritual body, and it refers to a spiritual or in dwelling. But in 2 Corinthians, it refers to a heavenly body in which a believer strives to be clothed in. In other words, Jesus resurrected in that heavenly body. And so we who believe in Christ will receive from the Lord the body as of his own glory. In 2 Corinthians we read, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. In the other words, to leave this body, to undress it and be clothed or moved into a new spiritual body. The word house in Greek is ikitirion, heavenly spiritual body, which angels left. We are actually earnestly desiring to clothe in. We want such habitation or a house. In Jude 6, it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, and that is the spiritual body. In other words, these angels who left their original estate or spiritual body habitation took the body which is of blood and flesh and they commit the sin of a natural sexual act, aiming in such a way to contaminate entire human existence. Not all angels did this, just a special group for who God ended the mercy time and put them in a special place. When this special group of fallen angels took the human body by nature, they had to fulfill all the last that the body desires for. In Galatians 5, 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. They have left heavenly spiritual body and took every human body to commit sin and disobedience, described in Genesis 6. Now we are going to read Jude verses 6 and 7 and bring a connection between all this we learned so far. Here it doesn't say directly what these fallen angels have done. However, it does say that Sodomites only repeated something that these fallen angels have done in the past. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he had reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment day. Then it says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, this word even as Sodom and Gomorrah means they've done something same as them. And it further it says, and the cities about them in like manner. When it says in like manner, in other words, uh, in the manner, like manner as this special group of fallen angels, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Unto fornication many things belong also, like intercourse with the lower beings, such as animals. For angels, a natural intercourse is when they materialize themselves and have, an in, uh, and have intimate intercourse with lower beings, such as humans. And because Sodom and Gomorrah repeated what those fallen angels have done, who were inspired by the ideas of these fallen angels, God had brought appropriate judgment upon them. Then he says Sodom and Gomorrah stand as a warning example to all future generations being destroyed by the brimstone and fire for eternity. Spiritual being can take bodily shape and participate in sexual acts and everything else which body or flesh desires. Then he says, 
and the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he had reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Let us now answer what are these everlasting chains, where the darkness is and what is the judgment of the great day. The judgment of the great day is the punishment they will receive after the millennium ends in the lake of fire, when all fallen angels and fallen men who follow their example will be destroyed in the lake of fire. For if God spared not the angels that sin, here he speaks of the special group of angels who cross the border, but cast them down to hell and deliver them unto the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Here we get an answer where the chains of darkness are, in hell or underground. Now we can go to the first coming of Christ. There is an interesting scene that happened. Um, there are two possessed in whom legion of angels dwelt in, and they did a great wickedness. One day Jesus went towards them, and they began to cry, saying, And when he was come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, they met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fears, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? In other words, angels say to him, We know you have to come at the end and destroy us, but why are you coming here before the time to disturb us? And there was a good way off from them, a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him. And we see devils begging Jesus. Now there is a question. If they are so evil, they hate Jesus, why they are begging him here? It is because the Lord has complete authority over them. And if they cross the border, God can execute the judgment upon them instantly. And that is why Bible says in James, devils believe and tremble. They are afraid of God because God has absolute power and authority over the earth and heaven too. And this text is telling us they have power just as much as God permits them to try to deceive people to follow them because God has given all people free will. But another Gospel of Luke gives us even more direct answer. Then Jesus engages a conversation with those fallen angels who are in men. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep or abyss. We see the great fear of the angels. We also see when they moved towards the Lord to attack him, they stood for a second thinking, if they have maybe crossed the border. So they besought the Lord not to command them to go into the abyss or hell, which is the other translation for the deep. And what is the deep or hell? It is like a solitary confinement or quarantine where they have no rights of movements to deceive other people, but for thousands of years imprisoned to the solitary confinement waiting for the judgment which will happen at the end of millennium. If we carefully read Bible, we can see that some terrible angels who have done some terrible sins in the times of Noah, but also after in the Promised Land, were put in that hell or deep, now for thousands of years, spending time by themselves. And there was an herd of many swine feeding in the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. This is such a great encouragement. Fallen angels cannot even enter the swine, which are unclean animals according to the Bible, unless the Lord allowed them to do up to their request. And so only if the Lord allows them, then they are able to enter these animals. This is telling us that God is giving much more protection and love towards men. However, because angels are inspiring men to follow their steps, they uh, use the circumstances and possess the men. But when these possessed people turn to God, He mercifully heals them and casts out the fallen angels from them, same as He had done in the case we just read. Then went the devils out of man and entered into swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. The verse from Revelation is telling us that Satan as well, at the beginning of millennium, will be tied down and also placed in 
this deep or hell or bottomless pit. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. He will be released from the hell of bottomless pit, and again he will deceive people, and God will bring a judgment upon Satan and his angels and all people who follow them. Now we have a question. When did the angels commit this sin? And the angels which kept not their first state, but left their own spiritual dimension and materialized, he had reserved in everlasting chains under the darkness, unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. When did the angels commit this sin? The answer is in Genesis 6. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, and the sons of God saw, and we did read this text in the Old Testament, how sons of God are angels, so they saw the daughters of men. In original text it says, Adam's daughters, that they were fair, and they took them vice of all which they chose. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. In the other words, it says, before the flood, giants were there and also after that. Here we get an answer where giants come from after the flood. When God have judged the world with the flood, all these contaminated types of life have been destroyed. But here we get an answer how it happened again. There were giants in the earth in those days, which is the pre-flood, and also after that. Here we have some texts which talk about those giants who were after the flood in the promised land. When God revealed to Abraham that his descendants will be slaves in Egypt for 400 years and after that go to the promised land, Satan used this opportunity and created seven nations who were hybrids or we can say Nephilim, who were the combination of fallen angels and men. They were of gigantic dimensions. Before the flood, people used to be much taller than after the flood. The average height of a man was 4 meters, but the hybrid ones created by the mixture of fallen angels and men were massive, gigantic dimensions and were 6, 8, 10 or more meters tall. So read in the biblical report in Numbers, which says, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So when the spies from Israel nation went to the promised land to see what kind of land is that, and what kind of people live over there, they saw these giants, and they looked so tiny before them like grasshoppers, and so were the Israelites in their sight. But the Lord had promised he will destroy all such forms of life, because they are irreversibly evil and complete angel evilness is incarnated in them. The plan of salvation for such Nephilim, it does not exist. We read, Yet destroy I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroy his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. And here we get an answer. Why was God destroying? So there were different forms of life, there were hybrids, Nephilim, and there were persons, let's say half angel, half men, and they were enormously evil, and like that, they were showing their evilness to God and people around them. And God could not act upon their free will anymore to return them to himself, to be able to save them. But they were so evil, and their children were evil too, very evil. And this is the reason why God brought the judgment upon them. But in His great mercy, there is a text in Isaiah saying that Nephilim uh, will not be resurrected, will not receive the judgment, which is 
after the millennium. They have already received the judgment from God by being killed, so God will not resurrect them anymore to receive the judgment. Why? Because the plan of salvation never existed for them. Practically, it is a place where even God himself cannot do anything anymore to save such a man. It is a point where the free will is completely destroyed, completely perverted, so God cannot act on their will to attract them by his love in order to save them. Then he says, When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Then in Deuteronomy we read, That also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumims. We can see here giant skulls and giant skeletons. Here is the question made. Who were the ones to use those stairs? Um, we see there are several times taller than the modern man. Then in the next text he says, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it. We see when angels were incarnating in the same size and making the children with the daughter of men, after the flood giants were of five, six or more meters high, when the average man of that time was just about two meters high. However, pre-flood giants were eight, nine, ten or more meters high. Here we have the skulls of these giants. Many pictures with them, the skeletons are massive sized. For us today, this is simply unimaginable. Normally, they burn these skeletons because today's people who don't believe in creation, but evolution, they are systematically destroying these proofs in order to hide the authenticity of the Bible. Then two little people next to the skeleton of massive dimensions. Next photo we see chimera, and that is bottom part from a fish and top of a man. Not only people were infected with the DNA change, but the animals too. Here we have a picture. The picture on the left shows us the differences between the skull of a normal man and a skull of a Nephilim. On a human skull we have three seams, while on Nephilim skull is only two. Jaw of a normal man has teeth all the way to the end of the jaw, while Nephilim teeth go up to the middle of the jaw. Nephilim jaw is several times larger than the jaw of a normal man. Nephilim usually had six fingers and toes on each hand and foot. We have those reports written in Bible. On the next photo we see gigantic feet prints found in Africa, South America and everywhere across the world, which even remained until today. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, fallen angels, saw daughters of men that were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Daughters of men in Hebrew was written as Benot Adam which literally means Adam's daughters. Original text in Genesis daughters says daughters of Adam and sons of God, therefore fallen angels and daughters of Adam. Why? So the seed of fallen angels can enter the women who would bear them Nephilim or most evil men. The outcome is the same, whether it is the child or grown person or the old person. God was bringing judgments, but upon such people, because the level of evilness in them was so high that we cannot even imagine. The little child, but already commits so much evil deeds, it, it is almost impossible for us to understand. Then in the time of Noah we read, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Generations that came after as a result of unity between sons of God and daughters of men were giants. If a normal man marries a normal woman, then there is no reason for their progeny to be giants or men of all men of renown.
down. Why would God decide to bring the flood upon the earth when he never banned marriages between the progeny of Seth and progeny of Cain? There are some people who explain this text in a different way that they were the sons of Seth and daughters of Cain. If such a Seth theory would really exist, then we would have one faithful man married to an faithful woman. And what would be the outcome? Here we go, they got a giant. That's one theory. But it's obvious that it doesn't work. Only shameful perverted intercourse of fallen angels with daughters of men brought this terrible judgment upon the earth. Intercourse between sons of God and daughters of men caused the contamination of body genetics or human flesh. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. This is said for both human and animal, because God let in the ark only those normal types of animals which he created and which were not genetically changed. Hebrew word for flesh is bashar, and it literally means body, soft tissue, flesh or skin. This is what became corrupted. It was corrupted to that extent that it wasn't in the way God created it. So for them there was no plan of salvation. Where is the problem now? When Adam fell, his nature became fallen. Onto his descendants he passed his fallen nature. But this nature Jesus redeemed. Now in relationship between fallen angels and men, new or another nature is being created which is so contaminated that the plan of salvation does not work for it at all. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In this verse, God announced that Eve's descendants, progeny, or seed, will triumph above snakes or Satan's seed. Because Messiah was promised to come through Eve's progeny or seed, Satan's main goal was to completely contaminate or degenerate human race genetics in order to prevent the birth of Messiah and his first coming. Because of that reason, God flooded the entire earth to destroy Satan's progeny or seed, but to save Eve's seed, Noah, who is described as perfect or without defects in his own generation, through whom Messiah was to come. We see how long the Lord waited until he came to the last family, which remained genetically unchanged. And so, if God did not intervene towards us out of his love, at that point the plan of salvation will have to end if only Noah and his family got affected. The Lord Jesus wouldn't have a human body in which he could come. We see God waited for the last minute, last chance, so the flood judgment is a great act of mercy in which he destroyed all of perverted abomination types of life, but saved those for whom the plan of salvation was still possible and through whom the Messiah was able to come. Hebrew word used for perfect in his generation, and it is said for Noah, is tamim, and is defined as one without a blemish, without defect, innocent or perfect. Here we have a theologian who explains. When I say ancient times, I think of the days of Noah, where we have ancient writings from all across the world, which say that very powerful angels came down to earth and mingled themselves with men. The time had come when only Noah and his children through him, according to the Holy Scripture, were found perfect in their generation. Why did the flood come? Bible is clear. Because every flesh, both human and animal, came corrupted. Something was happening in the time of Noah which was connected with genetics, corruption of God's creation. What does it mean when Torah says for Noah that he was perfect? Yes, that's the Hebrew word tamim, which was used to describe the sacrificial lamb without blemish. Here in Deuteronomy we read, And if be any blemish therein, as if it be lame or blind, or have any ill blemish, thou shalt not sacrifice it unto the Lord thy God. It is because it represents Christ, or the Lamb, with no blemish. The Lamb had to be Tamim, or without blemish. Tamim, or without blemish, speaks of genetics about DNA which is not corrupted, comparing to the corruption which took the rest of the world in the times of Noah. 
It happened that human genetics became corrupted through mutual marriages between men and fallen angels, which was spreading around for hundreds of years until it came to Noah in the end, who was the only left example of genetic material with a DNA structure in the way God made it. Do you understand why God had to send a flood? To destroy all these contaminated forms of life is the reason why he sent the judgment in the times of Noah. Jesus said, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. With everything we spoke of until now, we made a good introduction into the next question. What is the mark of the beast? How will Satan contaminate and ruin the genetics of a man in the last days, as he has already done in the past? The answer is the mark of the beast. In the past time, fallen angels, through the intimate intercourse with daughters of men, did mix their angelic DNA with human DNA, creating gigantic or giant progeny. Today, with genetic engineering, they are not trying to create giant progeny, but people who will be same as everyone else, but who will be far superior than others. Superhuman will live far much longer than normal man. His immune system will be strong, which will make him almost immune to any illnesses, and by his intellect will be preeminent. Now I will use this chance to speak of the Time magazine cover. As the leaders of the New World Order are the ones who produce this magazine, they gave the answer here what is the solution for immortality as they believe. In fact, it is one of the satanic deceptions, but they are deeply assured it will happen that way even though that's a lie. And then we can read the title of the magazine which says The Future of the Medicine. And what is that? We see here a DNA spiral which is combined from two spirals and we see that one is from the snake and another from the man. In other words, if they succeed to mix the DNA so it becomes half man, half angels, then it will be the way to help humans to become healthy, to live eternally. Here is the fulfillment of satanic deception which tells us we will become like gods because Satan presents himself to the people of this world as God, and he requires to be worshipped as God from his followers. He promised them they will become like gods, or God of this world. He is a fallen angel who is deceiving his followers, and they together with him will be destroyed one day. It is important once again to mention that the goal of the future of the medicine for the creators of the New World Order is mingling of DNA between fallen angels and men. They even publicly showed it on the main page of their magazine. In the last deception, Satan and fallen angels will give their DNA to men. We'll speak about the seed of Satan. He doesn't have to do it as he did in the old days, by old-fashioned way, but simply he can achieve it over the DNA genetically. Genetic Modifications we see here great Satan's deception. Satan desires are to overtake the world. He can achieve this if he pass his genetics, his seed, and that is his DNA, onto the human race. That is the solution for a destruction of a man. God said our whole spirit, soul, and body remain preserved with no guilt for the coming of Christ. But Satan realized when he destroys the body, then he also destroys entire spirit, soul, character. And such a disordered person who accepts the DNA by their own decision becomes demonized, irreversibly evil, and God is not possible to act upon the conscience of such a person anymore. God is trying, but the will of the person doesn't want to come back anymore. That is the position of person who is incorrigible and for whom the plan of salvation does not exist anymore and whom even God himself cannot help anymore. Here we receive the answer to the question which is made at the beginning of the study. Now we continue further. Recombined DNA can be injected or through the chip, e tattoo or QR code into a human body and then such a DNA becomes a part of that man. Recombined DNA spreads over the entire system uniting with the DNA of the person receiving it where such a person becomes completely and literally genetically transformed. 
Basically, genes of fallen angels are being mixed with genes of humans by genetically transformed personal cures, which is also known as Nephilim. DNA upgrade, a very popular and modern term which scientists use to attract masses, will enable people to strengthen their immune system so they wouldn't become ill anymore and the lifespan will expand on 500 years or more, as it was in the pre-flood time, which shall be irresistibly attractive deception. As we read before, Jesus said it will be as in the times of Noah, and it will be irresistibly attractive deception for this generation. As we can see, this generation is suffering of many different diseases. It's very weak, and it will be so irresistibly attractive deception to many. And then the DNA transformed person ceases to be a man, that is human, and becomes Nephilim, and irreversibly evil. So that the judgment from Revelation is completely the same as for the pre-flood world, which is the complete destruction. In fact, the person consciously chooses to position where God cannot help them anymore, where the plan of salvation ceases to exist for the person. The mark of the beast has four characteristics, and he calls it all to receive the mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. One of the characteristics is that nobody will be able to buy or sell anything without the chip or the mark of the beast. Second one, it says, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, this is the first plague, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worship his image. We see that the chip, or so-called high-tech tattoo, which enabled us to get a DNA upgrade, shows itself as a great curse now. It bursts upon the skin of the forehead or right hand, depending where it was received, creating a skin cancer, causing immeasurable pain and sufferings. 3. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Now the DNA upgrade becomes and shows itself as a great curse. All people who were received at some point, thinking this is something so glorious and progressive, will now see the story has changed and when the chips burst, people will suffer, gaining the skin cancer and they will desire to die according to the text, but the death will flee away from them. And this is how they will have to pass entire five months of the last seven plagues of great sufferings. So the second coming of Christ will be mercy to them to end their pains and sufferings. When lifespan becomes extended for many, many more years, as in the days of Noah, DNA upgrade becomes a curse to everybody who received it. During the times of the last seven plagues, people are suffering much longer because they cannot die. And the last characteristic says, Everybody who receives the mark of the beast will end up in the lake of fire and brimstone. For them there is no more mercy nor forgiveness. The seal of God represents the character of Christ which is given to us through the Holy Spirit and so being sealed with it. On the other hand, the mark of the beast represents complete degeneration of a man who becomes the creation of Satan, irreversibly evil. That is the mark of the beast, respectively the mark of the character of Satan himself and of his fallen angels. The same judgment we see Nephilim received in Genesis 6, then Sodom and Gomorrah, and all nations which were killed by Joshua and Caleb when they took Israel to the Promised Land. Wherever Nephilim were present, the judgment was always the same, which is complete destruction. Very soon the greatest deception will happen when the fallen angels will come to us as UFOs, alien beings showing their interest to apparently help us, and when an upcoming big deception comes, aliens, and they will come, Bible tells us so, they will offer two things for us. First, free energy which piles the crowds, and second, DNA upgrade. And if the person takes this DNA upgrade, his DNA will become altered. Yes, he would not have diseases for 500 years or more, but the problem is that you are no longer human. You become Nephilim, and that is why the judgment in the book of Revelation is exactly the same as Genesis 6. There is a correlation between them. No mercy, but the judgment and complete destruction. One of the futurology pioneers, mystery professor named F.M. 2030, 
preached the concept of a new man in New York in 1960s. In 1989, he gave an interview in the show held by Larry King about his book called Are You a Transhuman? He was born under conventional name Ferraden M. Esfandari. During his life, he changes his name to FM 2030, which reflects his beliefs and trusts in the future. He explained it this way. Name 2030 reflects my belief that around 2030 will be a magical time. From 2030 we will not age anymore and you will have a great chance to cross to immortality. 2030 is the dream and the goal. We see the dream of this world is to have immortality, to live eternally, to live forever. But not in the way God chose and gifted to us, but simply they will be fooled into the deception of fallen angels trying to have immortal and eternal life, but in the way of Satan's doings. It will later come out as a great deception and curse which will bring unto them eternal destruction, rather than eternal life. This deceit Satan will cunningly present to people by imitating intelligent alien beings through his fallen angels, who will offer us a solution for all illnesses, so to give us DNA upgrade with much longer life than people have ever had it until now. Here one theologian says that he believes this DNA transformation will happen with the Antichrist as a matter of fact with the very last Pope. Jesus Christ was a representative, express image of his Father who has sent him to the earth, through who he was revealed and glorified. Jesus said, He that has seen me had seen the Father. Even so, the Antichrist will be representative of Satan himself, through whom will Satan glorify himself and deceive the entire world. Jesus said, You belong to your father the devil, and you want to do what your father desires. He was a murderer of men from the very beginning. We see who Satan is, the murderer of men, what kind of thought he has towards men. And he has no place in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he is expressing his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The last pope, as the Bible tells us, and the Antichrist, John Paul II, who is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goes into perdition, uh, was in very poor health condition back in 2005 when he was taken away from the stage. In fact, Bible tells us the last pope will have two reign periods, that he reigned and after some time will not be, and will come and reign again, and from there will go into perdition. As Bible calls him the son of perdition, who will be killed by the sword or breath of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ, when he shall return on clouds with the host of heaven. When he was removed from the scene in 2005, his movement was very weak and his health condition was very poor, but his return will be Satan's masterpiece. It even says John Paul's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. He will upgrade Paul's DNA with his own, extending and improving his life and health, and will represent him as a great example of what a man can become when he accepts a grade from alien beings. Also, he will return as resurrected savior of the world. What is going to happen at the end of history of this world? Here is the answer, Jesus said. And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world. The good seeds are the children of the kingdom. That seed is the Christ Spirit, or Holy Spirit, who has come and abide in us to give us new birth, and so to become the sons of God. However, on the other hand, we have the tares, but the tares are children of the wicked one. The enemy that saw them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels, who will separate one from another. At the end of the earth's history, it will appear two creations, God's and Satan's, and it refers to the body and the spirit, respectively to complete being, seal of God or mark of the beast, character of God or character of Satan. What will be the end to it? Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, that's Nephilim, the Satan's creation, they will be burned down, but gather the wheat into my barn, in other words, the wheat will be taken to heavenly Jerusalem, which is God's barn. Jesus said that there are many homes in the place where he is, and he will come one day to take us with himself where he is. That is the heavenly barn. 
As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Then the question follows, which is the real solution for immortality? Philippians says, Lord, who shall change our vile body, earthly body, they may be fashioned like unto his glorious body or the spiritual heavenly body, Ikitirion, according to the work whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. It is the same body of the angels that can pass through the wall or materialize to become visible or dematerialize to become invisible. This is the body that God prepared for us who love him. Let us be godly men, let us be born again from our Lord Jesus Christ. May God, by his own Holy Spirit, abide in us and be our righteousness. May he help us to dress one day in the heavenly glory, that is the spiritual body, and to shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of our Father. May this be yours and my experience. Warm greetings until our next fellowship.